You know, Easter was a huge event last week, and you can see how the crowd has already dissipated. It's like the ocean, you know, they come in once a year during the tide or Christmas. C&E Christians, I think they're called. Christian, I mean, Christmas and Easter Christians. Ecclesiastes 1.9, the smartest man in the whole world said this. Well, I guess that's not true. It was Jesus, but the non-God man, smartest guy in the world. <laughs> the thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Now, this dude is so genius, right? That pe Cle uh, Queen Cleopatra just heard about his wisdom and just wanted to go sit and hear it with her own ears. Wow, what they said about you wasn't even half true. Because there's more than that. That man, looking out his window of his castle, you know what? There is nothing new. Things always just repeat themselves. Nothing's ever new, you know. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It has been already of old time, which was before us. Is the last one? Is that it? Okay, so watch this, except for Easter. That's the first time that there's actually been something absolutely brand new. It should change everything. If there's nothing new, there's nothing new. You can't write a new book. You can't come up with a new idea. You can't have a new joke. That joke's already been told by somebody 4,000 years ago in the cave. Why did the chicken cross the rope? To get to the dinosaur egg. Come on, y'all. That's just, that's just for y'all. Now, I don't know if everybody believes in dinosaurs. Where are they in the back? Back to this. Some of y'all get me in trouble. All right, so if everything changed, and it did on Easter, it was so different and so new that it would take a long time, maybe, for us to finally finally, maybe just barely get it. So that's why, do you know what Jesus has been doing since last Sunday? Acts. The former treaties have I made. So this is Luke. He's writing his second uh, novel, which is Acts. Here's what he said, O Theophilus, lover of God, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. That was the book of Luke. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible Proofs. Do you know what infallible is? That's the Pope. Oh, you don't know nothing about that? That dude, if he told us the sky was red, everybody in the world would throw away their books and write the new color of the sky because this guy cannot make a mistake. He is infallible. Well, somehow that word is being used to say how Jesus for 40 days after Easter showed himself alive with infallible proof. Was that Jesus? I thought I saw him at Texaco the other day. I mean, he kind of had his car, but I don't know if it had the same color seat. But Infallible proof is him coming up with anybody call him. Hey, boy, it's me, Jesus. Ow. <laughs> Being seen of them, you know how long 40 days is? 
That's enough time for me to get bored for some of you. <laughs> but, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, that means he wasn't even finished yet. He just rose up from the dead and he said, man, I still got 40 days left on my lease. Walking around here, look, man, I'm alive. I'm alive. Look, I'm alive. Hey, y'all, I'm alive. I'm alive. 40 days, 40 days, 40 days, 40 days, 40 days, 40 days. You know, the after Easter lesson is what I want to talk to you about. It's huge. Where's Jesus been all week? With his boys and his girls. We read about that on Easter. God lifted the women up so high on Easter. That <laughs> I don't, ain't no man going to tear him down from that. Oh, well, we did, though. Do you know that they were not fully persuaded yet? Whoa, now. That's different. You got to be fully persuaded because if Jesus is about to send them off to do what he was doing, then they couldn't be just like, I, that wasn't a mirage, was it? Now, now we're sure that happened, right? You were there, weren't you? Okay, just triple check. Like, that's how we're going to go out and tell everybody that Jesus is alive? Because, hmm. what about infallible proof for 40 days till you just like, whoa now. I think I can get it now. Let's see, if we, is that three? And then go to Luke. Luke 19.10 tells us that for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's his mission. That's his mission. That's what Jesus did. Now, if we have to do what Jesus did, DWJD, that's the bracelets we should be wearing. That W thing, I don't know what that was. That WWJD was to get us to DWJD. We need to be doing what Jesus did. Well, what would Jesus do? Well, I'm going to do what he would do. That's our mission. That was his mission. That becomes our mission. To seek and save that which is lost. You think Jesus went back to heaven? He left some people here that still need to be healed. They still needed to be delivered and set free. They still needed abandonment and rejection uh, rooted up out of their life so they could believe God as Father. The Holy Spirit's down in there working all through that mess to try to get an Abba out. Anyway, so if this assignment gets passed to us, and it does, look at John 20. 20 nobody really understands this assignment right here, but Jesus is so specific that you can't even hear what he's saying. As the Father sent me, so send I you. What? Man, let's just hang right here for a minute, Jesus, because that makes zero sense. That's what he said. Now, give me the next verse, because then in order to do that, then he had to equip us with his equipment that he had. But there was still something left to equip them with. Forty days. They needed to be equipped. With what? Let's find out. So this is where Easter, see what, okay, so this is why it's important to me is because when Jesus comes out of the tomb and it's Easter and you find all the cowards and the women are trying to tell the men and it seems like idle tales and now they're barely figuring it out and, and then all of a sudden you got Jesus who comes along and he says, okay, now it's your turn. And he passes the assignment. Look at 1 Timothy 2.19. This tells me that Easter could have stopped and been ruined with them. They are to begin to play the telephone game. Now, I've told you, now you go tell somebody, and when they believe, they, they, they'll, they'll pass it on to somebody who believes, and they'll pass it on to somebody who believes, and they'll pass it on to somebody who believes, and then I heard the message. That's what Jesus is doing. He's passing down Easter message to them. You got to go tell them that Jesus has died and rose again from the dead. He is not dead. Jesus ain't dead. Here's how Easter could have been ruined. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from sinfulness. 
But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some of honor, and some of dishonor, and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, ready, perfect for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. If, 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 if. Because if you don't, read it backwards. You are not prepared unto every good work. You are not ready for the master's use if you do not purge yourself of things inside of you. Because you cannot be a vessel that carries the gospel around when your vessel is cracked, broken, and full of junk. Amen. But the disciples had that kind of vessel. The disciples were so scared. You're trying to take a message of fearlessness and stick it in that vessel. <laughs> Hey, go tell everybody everything will be fine. <laughs> okay. Well, that ain't gonna work. Flee youthful lust. Follow righteousness, faith. Oh, I don't remember giving you this. Righteousness, faith, love, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. That's where we all should be striving to get to. You know, Easter could have been ruined right here because passing the assignment to broken vessels would ruin the movement. That's what it tells me. It tells me that if you take the gospel and you try to send it out in broken vessels, then they're not going to be ready for the master's use and they're not going to be prepared under every good work. And that's how we got a lot of people out there right now knocking on them drug doors. Bum, 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 bum. Here, can I give you this cup of cold water and this peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Yeah, you want to come in and hit this? Just real quick. All right. God loves you. Have a good day. No, uh, wait, 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 wait a minute. So the gospel is in vessels of addiction and lying and cheating and, and pornography and just all these things. But, but oh, look at me, I'm a man of God carrying the gospel. Broke as a joke. Easter could have been ruined by being stopped with them. So if you were going to pass water down in a bucket, but the, some of the buckets started having holes in them. All of us get our buckets together. We got to pass water down the line. All of a sudden, at the, towards the end, people got all these holes in their bucket. It stops. It's the progression that Jesus said, those who believe in my name shall cast out. Go and preach the gospel and those who believe will lay hands on the sick, cast out demons, speak with other tongues. Those who believe what you are, message I'm sending with you, bam, 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 it's going to keep on going all the way down until I hear it and I lay hands on the sick now. And I cast out demons and I speak with new tongues. I drink deadly things called Coca-Cola and Kool-Aid and whatever else. White sugar. You know, God didn't make white sugar. Okay, all right. <laughs> Never mind. We just ruined it, y'all. I'm just telling you. It was a GMO. All right, so today this is what's happening right now. In the church, what I'm... What I'd like to expose about Satan is I see your stupid plan and I'm here to attack your plan. I'm going to attack the attack back. And this is what he's doing. He's figuring out or he's already figured out way before we were born. If I could just keep these vessels broken every time God goes to pour himself in these vessels. Where's God? He lives inside of you. If I could just get God inside of these broken vessels and just make them just so where God can't do anything in them because they're so selfish. They're so worried about keeping themselves alive. Anytime you want to let me, God talking to you in your inside, anytime you want to let me drive. That's what I said to in the back of a cop car one time. Right before I kicked out the window. And <clears throat> Today, this is what's happening. Watch this. We got a bunch of faithless Christians, cowards, fears, got all kinds of phobias, carnal minded Christians. They're not any good to God. You know why? Because the enemy has figured out a way to distract us with everything but making sure our vessel is sanctified, ready for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. If I could just keep them away from that. If I could just have them. Oh, you know what you need? More faith. That's your problem. 
You need more faith. That's why the whole bookstore is just full of books on faith. Preachers that talk about nothing but faith. That ain't your problem. Jesus said if you just had this much, you could throw things into the ocean that was bigger than a mountain. So that ain't your problem. How about your problem is what Jesus said. He said, it's not your faith that's the problem. It's all this stuff that's in there with your faith. That's the doubt and the common sense that God gave us. That common sense is always working against God. Peter was like, Lord, I want to get out of the boat, but your common sense is telling me. This is the evil plan of the enemy. We have vessels carrying the gospel that cannot be used. They cannot be drank from. Try to, try to fill up a cup that's got a hole in it and drink it. Uh, throw that thing away. So the, the, the enemy is thinking, if I could just fill the world full of evil and then fill y'all full of the world. Now he knows you ain't going to eat evil. Oh, but he put you like a frog in the boiling water and just turn it real slow just because now I got Christians going, don't you think abortion is, you know, kind? Are we calling evil good now? How did you get there, Mr. Miss Christian. Anyway, my point, my point is, how can you tell others about faith that you don't have? When Jordan walks in here and he tells me, is he here? Oh, I don't want to talk about his back. Well, anyway, y'all already know this. Jordan, in here, oh man, I'm going to prison. I said, man, you ain't going to prison. Yes, I am. No, you ain't going to prison. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to jump all these hurdles. We're going to go get your a blood test. We're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to do that. Blah, 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 blah. If I would have told him that we could jump all these uh, uh, earthly hurdles, then like he could have just went to somebody else. But my job is to tell him, brother, God's going to help you. Every person I see come up this hill, God wants to help you. I know, I know your life is broken because everybody's coming up that hill and your life is so broken. God wants me to sit you in this chair and tell you that he's going to take care of you and work everything out. And I've seen him do this to people who then turn and abuse it. So he'll still do it for you. So how can I tell him that? If I don't know that. How can somebody sit down with me and tell me that they're about to lose everything and be thrown out of their house and go to prison and do all this stuff and I'm telling you everything's going to be fine if I don't know that? That's how you have to minister to people. You can't minister to people going, you know, I think if we just, I th I th it's this and it's this and it's like this and he's not a dead and he's alive and he rose from the dead and our hope is in him. That's so matter of fact, man, you better get down on the get down. God's going to fix you. He's good. He's all good. God's going to fix you. He's going to help you. He's going to restore you because he wants you to be free. Man, I don't know, man. I don't know. Week after week, I keep telling, keep telling. Then boom, little things start happening in their life and then bam. And I go, whew. Next. Because I'm traveling through with y'all. That's why every time I'm like, well, so what's going on? Give me the update. I got to know every update. Colt. I woke up Monday morning. Somebody called me and said, we got an apartment for Colt. Do you want it? What y'all think I said? <laughs> Just kidding. I was like, I don't want to lose my son. <laughs> and he got a job working right down the street at a gas station. He could walk there if he wanted. Now, this is Colt who living in the closet right here that had no hope. Nobody's helping him. Everybody's turned their back on him. Nothing. And then God all of a sudden starts telling me, Brian, I'm going to be a father to the fatherless and you're going to get out of my way. Because I've complained about Colt. And God told me I'm going to be a fatherless father to the fatherless. And Brian, you're more mad at him than I am. I was telling God one day, the hardest test I've ever had to take, Colt now is one of the hardest tests. And he said, Brian, remember the end of that story. And I thought about to the end of that story, it was the greatest ending you've ever heard in your life. There was this little girl who was being molested and she got saved out from under the molester. Right there when nobody was knowing. And I pulled that chair up and I said, somebody touching you? Yes. Ooh, woo, woo. That was fun. But I had to go through the hardest test to get to the end of that story. And now look at this. 
Colt, who his own mother didn't even think he was capable of having his own place and a job. God did. God went further than I could go. And y'all think I can go further than you can go. Well, God went further than this guy went because he loves Colt. I don't even know why I'm into all that. That dude walked right in and took his driver license test. Here's my point. How are you going to tell others about love if you ain't got none? Man, there's some hateful Christians out there. Just plain hateful. There's still people stuck in bitterness. Some people still carrying granddaddy's old racism. Still being hateful and looking at the world the same way. And I'm a believer. But I meet around with my fellow believers and we believe the same thing. You ain't got no peace. There's Christians out there that ain't got no peace. And you're trying to tell people, it's okay, man. God will give you peace. I don't know how broken vessels can carry the gospel. But you take me, who I believe was the most broken vessel. Y'all don't ever believe that, but I, I got one witness right here, my old lady. She seen me doing a lot of changing. But before I even, I'm talking about I was just a rascal, dude. I couldn't tell you about love, peace, joy, not going to prison, uh, not God not finding you a house, God not giving you a car, God not giving you your kids back, God not helping you jump the earthly hurdles when you go with him and not them. Sometimes they'll, they'll move the hurdle a little further for you sometimes. I'm just saying, when you sit up in this hill right here and all you get is people who had their kids taken from them come in and in and in and in and in and you work with and work with, you hear all kinds of stories. I'm just saying you got to have God working with you in that system. And we got a brother in here proving it already. He worked, he worked them kids. I'm, I mean, he worked. Listen, that's God worked the system for you. The system that ain't for you, if it ain't for you, then God will work it for you. And that's the economy. That's your money. That's your job. That's your relationships with your children. How are you going to talk about provision if God's never given you any provision? Have you ever? I've lived abandoned apartments on a mattress with no clothes in my life and watch God provide everything for me and not send me to prison or let my probation officer uh, uh, come and take me out before he fixed me enough for she said that's okay I'm just saying how can I tell y'all about things if I haven't had these things in my life I've been healed I've been delivered I've been set free my mind has been I'm not even finished yet but I've been filled with love not my love his love he told me to agape you but that's God's love that means my love will run out. Anyway, I got to hurry up. I don't want to get stuck on here. You had to have all this stuff settled inside of you. And this is what 40 days after Easter did for these people. Jesus is passing the assignment on to them. And he was thinking about you. And he knew that these vessels must not uh, uh, ruin the movement. He had to make sure that he got down inside of them something that he had. And that's what I want to get to you before I end this sermon. I want you to see what he was trying to get down into him that all his earthly teachings did not do. The purpose of this is, was to activate their vessel. The purpose of the 40 days is to activate the vessel to carry the message. Jesus took some time setting them apart. So I believe this Easter story proves sanctification in this church. That's, that's my main doctrine. It's whenever we get saved, we got something to do. We got to start cleaning ourselves out. We still believe in fear and worry and we think about sex the same way and we think about brokenness the same way and we think about all this junk the same way. You got to come in and start getting your mind right and cleaned up. You're like the man in the cave cutting himself on chains. And when they found him, they said, man, he was clothed in his right mind. Well, that's where we're getting to. We butt naked out of our minds. And Jesus says, sit down, let me clothe you and put you in your right mind. And you know what that did? That scared everybody. Oh, they like it when you're all like, man, look, oh, yeah, oh Lord, we, we, we got this dude figured out. We, we, we know all about it. Why, why, hide your purse. It's when, it's when you start walking around with your suit on and, and then you, your mouth is different and you're all cleaned up and now your friend's like, they don't know what to do. Now it's weird that the guy in the tombs is all clothed in his right mind now it's weird that the storm that was just about to kill us Jesus just calmed the storm and now I'm really freaked out wait now you're really freaked out 
You mean when my mama who used to tell me, Brian, on camera, and wrote me a letter and said some things to me. She came and sat on that back pew, but out I go, shh, and watched me real close. She didn't have a lot to say. When, when, when you put somebody in the tombs and they're lost and that's just the way they are, and then you find them clothed in your right mind, you really don't. Back to this. They needed this 30, 40, I mean, excuse me, 40 days of cleansing their mind and their will and their emotions for the assignment. You know, Jesus' vessel and my vessel are not the same. He didn't have any of that to get out. Nobody abandoned Jesus and he, or that he took abandonment from. Oh, isn't that cool? They did abandon him. He had, he had disciples abandon him. He had followers abandon him. He had everybody, even on the cross. It was just the women there. I guess John was there. He didn't take none of it. So we have a broken vessel assignment. You know life breaks every vessel. Look at Acts 10, 28. If you're a broken vessel, you can't be used of God. If you're a broken vessel, you're not ready for good works. It says that Jesus, how Jesus was anointed. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good. Woo. Healing all who were oppressed of God. The devil. That's what a good work is. That you walking around like Jesus and he sees the oppression of the enemy and he goes around and he goes to do a good work. Jesus walking around, going to do a good work against the kingdom of the enemy. There's a kingdom of darkness out there. How are you going to be prepared to go out there and work a good work against the kingdom of darkness when you're rolling with it? You're driving out of the, the parking lot listening to demonic music. Going home late at night, looking at the computer at things. You know what I'm telling You ready to go out there and do what Jesus did? You can't. Because you ain't got what he had yet. But he's giving it to him. Oh, he's giving it to him. You want it? Oh, well, good. Let's go eat. I'm the only one. I, whew, I wasted my time with that sermon. I really can't sit down because I know there's one person in there, two people in three. All right. There's a couple people in there. All right, all right, all right. You know, just watching me and copying me will only take you so far. You can do that. It is possible to look at me, copy me, go get some results. Yeah. You're going to run into things that you can't, you, you're going to be, oh, whoa, I didn't see Brian. I ain't going to figure, I ain't, I ain't watch him do I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. You got to have how I think. Yes. See, I have to have how Jesus thinks. See how that works? And we have to have how he thinks in order to do what he did. You, you, you can't just do what he did without thinking like he thinks. Your thinker is broke. When you come to God, people have been molesting your emotions. And you think you're just going to go out there and do some good works when your whole vessel is just not ready for the master's use. But you can make it ready. Which is what we're talking about. Because that's what we always talk about, right? We're we'll talking about the mark of the beast here in about a couple of weeks. So, if y'all are bored with this, we'll talk about something. But we coming back to that. Everybody's like, mm. Here's him passing the ministry. This is what Jesus did. John 6, 28 and 29 is the key verse for this sermon. Then said they unto him, man, I love some of these questions in the Bible. Some of them are dumb as dirt and some of them are great. And this one is a great one. Whew. Hey, Jesus. What do we do that? We might work the works of God. Well, that's an interesting question. 
What does he say? What a stupid question, is what he said. No, he didn't say that. That was a great question. And here's the answer. This is the work of God. Whoa, now, he changed it. I'm telling you, boy, he's so slick. If you don't catch what he's saying right here, he slipped, he slipped that little change in there. No, this is the work. What do we do that we might work the works of God? How do I go over here and lay hands on the, on the, le on the leper? Show me how to do that. Well, you take your hand and you stick it over until it touches the skin of the leper and then you say with your mouth these words. Mm, that ain't what I'm talking about. Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe on Him in whom He sent. Who is that? That we believe on Him, the Father, in whom He sent. Jesus. So we believe on him and whom he sent. Who's the he? He sent Jesus. So we believe on Jesus. That's the work. Every time I catch y'all failing, that's where you fail. You stop believing in Jesus, the source. It's not cups of cold water and healing and leprosy and band. Mm -mm. The work is I get up every day, no matter what I'm facing, I'm believing in Jesus. That's my work. Because when I go out this door, everything is going to fight me for that. Everything is going to try to get my faith moved or at least get me to share some of my faith or belief. But my work today is like a straw, looking through a straw all day at Jesus. And I ain't moving this straw. I'm going to drive down the road like this all day. When Jesus was passing this ministry to them, you know, they were with him three and a half years, but they still didn't have everything he had because they had to do this. Jesus was trying to have get them to have the same mind that he had. You can't just go do the same things. You got to have the same mind. Let me show you this and we'll be done. I can see the kids are moving, so we got to go. Do you know in John 6? I'm just going to turn there because this is the story where Jesus fed the 5,000. I almost was looking at that today when I was thinking about uh, the Lord's Supper that we were having right here. He just feeds everybody. It's like the basket, like he broke his body and stuck the bread and the juice and it just feeds the whole world and it never runs out. It's like we could set this table up and just feed the whole world and never have to put anything in there because he gave us. Anyway. This John 6, look, the Bible says that he was about to feed the 5,000. You know what he told the uh, disciples? Here, let's go to verse 5. Philip said, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? What did Jesus say? Peter, where's your, he said, uh, Philip, where's your paycheck? Uh-uh, I, I, I need you to go down to verse 5. That's 5. John 6, verse 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him. John 6. Okay. Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Give me the next verse. Do you know that Jesus told them to feed him? I'm going to skip this. Here's what I, I, no, I'm not skimming it. I want you to just see that he's training them to do what? That he's about to feed the 5,000. They say, where are we going to get the food? You know what he says? You feed them. Why is he doing that? Because it's not about the people. It's, uh, it, it, these are fishermen and he's got to make them fishers of men. In order to do that, they got to see through his eyes. So he's asking them, what do we got? Well, I don't think we got anything. Well, there's one boy has got a thing over there. Well, you feed them. That's what he said. You feed them. That's training, isn't it? Because right after that, he put them in a boat and they go to the other side of the boat and Jesus goes walking by the water like this beside them. He said he would have passed them if they wouldn't have said, hey, Jesus. And he comes over there and says, it is I, don't be scared. Peter said, if that's you, Lord, tell me to come out of the boat. What do you do? Bam. Walking on the water. Is this beating the brakes off of them or what? The Bible even says when he got back in the boat, the boat just translated to the other side of the lake. 
That means he got in the boat and then they were at the shore. You mean all the, look at this training. This is crazy, man. It's crazy stuff, man. We're breaking bread and walking on water and boats translating and him calming storms and all this training and they still don't have what it takes. Because the Bible says that in Romans 12 that our minds conform us to this world and Jesus had to spend 40 days breaking the brakes off their minds so that they could have something that he had. He already demonstrated from the Torah. He taught, he's not teaching them any more lessons. This ain't no more lessons. This ain't no more sit at my feet and listen to what I'm saying. This ain't no more let me demonstrate how to pray for the leper. This ain't no more of that stuff. This is in order to do the works I'm sending you to do. I have to take care of your believer. You have to believe in God. But look at Matthew 16. It says... It's 5 through 12, but the Bible says as they were going back over the uh, lake one more time, they begin to reason they had no bread. Now, Jesus stopped them and said, how many times have you seen me feed the, the masses? And you're sitting here worried. About, you see, they still don't get it. And I want to so, show you all that all the earthly training of Jesus was not enough to get them through his death or to carry the message. There had to be something else. Delilah wanted to know what Samson's source of power was. You remember Delilah, Samson, and... Well, believing in Jesus is the source of our power. I'm going to show you this, and then I'm done. Y'all made it. I don't know why I feel some wind right now. That's going to make me keep going. Thank you. Let me ask you this. What do you believe in? Not what do you believe? Well, I believe in laying hands on the sick and I believe in speaking in tongues. That's not what I'm asking. That's where we get stuck right there. Here's what it is. What do you believe in? And the better question is, who? Who? Your faith has a source. It's a who. It's not a what. It's not what you believe. In order to do what Jesus was doing, he had a source who he believed in, which was God. Look at Luke 11. He says this when he cast out, when he removed the fig tree, he said, just have faith in God. Go down to verse 22. Yeah, I can see what I did there. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Lazarus' tomb. Go to the next one in John. Can we see what Jesus' faith looked like right here? Jesus said unto her, I am not a, oh, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou should see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that, that look at that. This is his faith. Who is he talking to? The Father in front of them because he knows the Father heals him. See, that's his faith. His faith is not, I know death is fixing to hear what I say. No, no, no. I, I'm, my faith is I'm, I'm connected to the source. My faith is in the source. So it's not like when I go to get a house, I don't need to look at the economy because that's not my source or the newspaper. My source is God who says he owns all these houses. So we, watch this. Give me the next verse. And I knew that you hear me. Look at that. But because the people need to see this. Do you have that kind of faith? Everywhere you are in life, every day God's watching you. Every day. Everything you say, God's listening. Everything you say and do, God's with you. He's literally riding with you all the time. He's in your vessel riding in oneness. I mean, not if you won't let him with all your brokenness. But he wants to be in there riding with you. Do you know that about God? Somehow, some of y'all can leave him off to the side while y'all go do a few things and then come back and act like he, you left him. You didn't. But because of the people that stand by, that's what they said. I, I, I just want you to see his faith was in the source. Give me one more. Um, I don't know. Give me Luke 22. I'm going to show you something about faith. 
I'm almost done, I promise. I'm just going to run down through these scriptures. We have to believe in Jesus like Jesus believed in God. Now, I don't know why my scripture is missing, and I don't know if you wrote it down wrong or I wrote it down wrong. When Jesus went to the sycamore tree, he wanted to get a fig off of it because he saw a leaf. When he got there, it didn't have no fig on it. So he cursed the tree. He said, ain't no man going to eat off of you. I don't know if he yelled. I doubt he yelled. It says that something, well, one version says immediately from the roots it withered up. The next day said they were, one of the other says that they passed it the next day. They noticed it was withered up and they made a, uh, a comment to Jesus. Jesus said, well, just believe, have faith in God. Have faith in who? What's he talking about? Casting mountains in the oceans and plucking up sycamore trees. Have faith in who? So when you speak to a mountain, who's your faith in? Yourself? The mountain? Is your faith in the faith? That's where faith is today. Faith is in faith today. But faith should be where? In God. It's got to be in God. That was Jesus' superpower. His faith was in God. Everything I do and say, it's just in God. My faith is in God. My source is in God. I'm not in order to do the works. This is what he's trying to get them. They've already learned how to do works. Now they've got to have the faith that he had in his mind. Let me show you this. Romans, uh, I mean, yeah, I got my Luke 22, good. And the Lord said to Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you. People, people, Satan has desired to have you. And me. That he may sift you as wheat. Watch this. But I have prayed for thee that what? Oh, whoa now. That your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brother. And what keeps him in there? What did the Lord pray for him to have? Faith was going to sustain him through the uh, Job moment. See, that's what Job had that sustained him through all that was just believing in God. Believing in God. Because all of his friends was telling him all the reasons why. Mm -mm. His faith in God. It was just him. He would always just go back to anchoring it in God. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. That even makes sense. But God's this. But I know God to be this. But I know God to be that. And by the end, Job had double. Well, it's just like this. As Peter was going through his mess, you got to have the faith in order to do the work of God. You know how Jesus was able to go through the resurrection and through the cross is because he believed in who? The Father. Okay, Romans 4. I got a few more scriptures and we're done. Four. Romans 4. Now we're going to start getting into this is what I want you to see that they didn't have was the super strength, the superpower that Jesus had. Jesus had in order to do all of his works was not faith in his faith or faith in the power of God or his goodness. It was always just believing in God. This is Abraham who against hope believed in hope. You ever had that in your life? You ever had everything in your life telling you no, 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 no? Just like Abraham's uh, old lady's womb was telling him, uh-uh, uh-uh. And Abraham said, uh-huh. Oh, yes, sir, doctor. You could turn your x-ray machine off right now. You ain't talking me out of this. We're going home to have a baby right now. who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being, uh-oh, this is what they did not have. And being fully persuaded that what, was it the promise? Look what he just did. He went from the promise, the promise, the prom to he who promised. If you don't see that about your faith, you're going to miss it. I got the promises of God, I got the promises of God. Yeah, you're going to take care of me. All the promises of God, the promises of God, the promises of God. Oh, they're going to take care of me. Oh, they're going to help me. The blessing of the Lord makes you rich. Blah, 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 blah. You don't believe none of that. 
because you don't believe in the one who made the promises. You're just trying to believe in promises. Might as well just go get you a bunch of fortune cookies. Then you can believe in the machine that made the, or the, the cookies. <laughs> and being fully persuaded. So, you ever seen somebody stand in court like that? Yeah. Judge, you ain't moving me. Sir, we have you on videotape. <laughs> That's when you're real guilty. What if you're just so fully persuaded that you can get your kids back? That, that your loved one can be saved? That you can't come off drugs. That your kids will come back home. Hmm. Well, being fully persuaded that he, what he, what he, he, he had promised. He was able to perform. I got Christians out here that just are weaker than noodles. Because your faith is in the provision of God and all the promises and, in, and it's not in him. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He has all good for you. He will stand in the gap. He will stand in the fire with you. He will shut the mouth of the lion. He will heal your body. He will provide himself. He, 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 he is where all your faith goes into. I just wake up every day and my work is to keep my faith in he all day. He, 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 he is for me. Ooh. And that's a job. That's the work. If you want to go out there and do these things that we're talking about in here, your faith has to be in him. Well, I'm going out here, I'll do some of this stuff. Man, when I see somebody, all I think about is how God's looking at them. My faith is in how the father wants to take care of the fatherless. It's not about me or doing the work of taking care of the fathers. It's about me believing in the one who wants to be the father to the father. So I could just say, yes, sir, I will do that work. I will do it. Well, it's hard, man. I want to quit, man. I want to quit. But my faith is in God. And I know who he is. And if he wants to be a father to the fatherless, and I'm going to help him. I'm going to help him. You can have this vessel. Use me. Make me cry. Y'all yeah, get it later. He, 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 So Jesus is walking around for 40 days taking everybody's hand and shoving it into... Till you're like, okay, Jesus, I think I, I'm ready. Now they're walking off into the world fully persuaded by him. Where's their faith? In him. For 40 days, their faith was put in him. So when they walked out into the world, their faith wouldn't be like, oh no, oh no. It's in him. It's in God. I've seen God. I've seen God. I, I can't even, this world is starting to, lose its reality to me because I know who God is and God trumps everything. Second Timothy 1, 12. This is the finale. Now, I was thinking about a believer's funeral because you know we had a believer die the other day but he died on a chain. We're not supposed to die in addiction and all that mess. Those are broken vessels. Huh. But I was thinking about a firecracker show. You know, when we're born, we're firecrackers. We're supposed to boo into the darkness. Some of us are duds. That's what a funeral of a believer looks like to me. That looks like a dud that didn't blow up. And oh, for the witch calls, I also, this is Paul. He suffers these things, nevertheless, he suffers. How can he suffer? How can you suffer? How can I suffer? Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know in whom I have belief. How is Paul going to sit there chained up in the middle of a prison singing, Hallelujah? I don't know what he was singing. Oh, happy.
happy day. Oh, happy day. When these chains, they're going to fall away. Boom, 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 and the whole thing just fall apart. And it just doesn't even move. It just sits there. What's Paul's superpower? The same power Jesus had. Faith in God. Don't you think you need to know him a little better? How can you trust your father? You don't know anything about it. You're projecting your own father onto him. How dare we do that? You project this onto him. You get ready in this mirror. This is who you are. This is who he is. You want to believe in him? He, he wrote the promises. He's the one who gets the credit. He's the one your faith goes to. It's the object of your faith is God himself. And when you get that down, then these promises will start working. It's only when you get that down where these promises start. Then can you go do the work of God. Then can you lay hands on a leper two or three times. You know what I just said. You know what happened when the uh, little boy had the demon and the father came to Jesus and said, uh, I brought the boy to your disciples and he, they couldn't get the demon out. Oh, faithless generation, bring me that boy. Cast the demon out. Disciples said, how come I couldn't do that? He said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could have did it. But it's your unbelief. It's your unbelief that you have in there. It's your unbelief. Unbelief, unbelief, unbelief. Let's see if Paul said that. I just want you to see that he was persuaded in the one. That he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Do you live like that? Is your work that you get up and do for God every day keeping your anchor in Jesus? Okay. Because if you did, you would never, ever, ever worry. That's what it says. You would never, ever, ever, ever not have peace. That's what it says. Or joy. If you believed in God so much, these promises would just come alive because your faith would be in the one who promised and he is able to perform. He is able. I go lay hands on people. I know I'm not able. I love it when people come up. Well, you didn't do that. Thank you. All right, here's one of my finale scriptures. Let me make sure. This might be the last. I got one after this. Watch this. This is in Romans 8. Woo! How could Paul do what he was supposed to do without being fully persuaded in the one who he had been given the assignment from? I really don't think you could just have faith in resurrection. I don't, because then Lazarus could have just rose from the dead and then we could have just had that to anchor our faith in. I think it was the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and his risen self said, put your faith in me. The risen me. Oh, that's fun. Because that's the only new thing around here. <laughs> I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, or powers, or things present, or things to come. Woo! Give me that next verse. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me. That's when I get up every day in my work and believing in God because I am fully persuaded that today that neither life nor death nor principalities or powers nor heights nor this or that or angels or anything, everything, nothing is going to separate me from the love of God because we're in relationship and my faith is in him and I'm not fickle running off cheating on him every other day. Like I'm talking about my faith. Is in God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ooh, that's the love of God, which is in Christ. What, can I go back again. Those disciples, this is the end of the sermon, were not allowed to be sent out not fully persuaded. You 
are not allowed to be out there carrying the gospel, not fully persuaded. So whatever you need to do, shut up, get in your prayer closet and start working things out to God. You know what? I may not know you like I think I do or I should. You definitely can say the last one. So I, I'm going to start working on my relationship until I just get in such belief of you that I am fully persuaded in my life that you are able to perform these things. See how that works? You cannot skip that. He is the one who makes these promises a promise. They could not go unfully persuaded. Do you know that when Jesus found them, they were cowards and they were hiding? But do you know how they all died? Every one of them died for the gospel. There's like a Fox Book of Martyrs tells you how they all died. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know how accurate all that is, but it says that like uh, Philip or somebody went to India and threw him in the oven and speared him. And somebody else was pulled apart by horses and somebody else was boiled in oil. And somebody, Peter, they say, was hung upside down, which I don't believe. Anyway, you don't care about all the stupid stuff. When the disciples all became, see, fully persuaded, they were able to be like Job. See, we, we cut and run before we get the double. We cut and run because our faith don't last that long, because our faith is not in him. See, our faith is everything's going to be fine. Everything's fine. You see, God's a blessing. He's fine. Everything's fine until it's not fine. And then all of a sudden, it's really not fine because it was fine, but now it's not fine. See, because, because really, my faith has never been in God in the first place. So um, I just get moved around with all the situations that are just, uh, when it's good, I'm good. And when it's bad, it's bad. Man, you're just being blown all around everywhere. If you would anchor your faith in the one who made the promises. The one who made the promises to you is better than the promises. He's so for you. He's not against you. You need to check that out. You need to test that. You need the ability to carry that message to somebody else. And then, I'll, baby, you come. Let me just end it with this. First Corinthians 15. This is my last scripture. No, I'll go to 2 Kings. Are you fully persuaded yet? You got to be fully persuaded because there's something out there waiting on you right now that's trying to make sure you're not fully persuaded. <laughs> What you have to do with God is when you come to him, he's literally got an assignment on your life and he's going to take you off and do so far beyond your mind. You're going to have to have to have a different mind. When you come to God, here's what he wants to do to you. He wants to make you equipped with everything that Jesus had, which was the Holy Ghost. He had to have that. But he also had to have the same mind as Christ. The same mind as Christ was his faith was in God. Just like Paul, just like Abraham, just like us, when you go to have these promises and you're believing for healing, don't believe in the promises. That's almost witchcraft in a sense. You got your spell book out. But it's the power behind this. It's the promise maker. God, you made me this promise of healing. I believe in you and I trust you and I know your goodness and I know your provision. I'm telling you what, that's how you get fully persuaded and how you work these problems. It's not like if you just take this little healing thing and it's working some over here, but don't work over there. And then you're just like, oh, I just don't understand. When I pray for somebody and they're healed and I pray for somebody and they're not healed, I never change my mind about what God thinks. Because it's not the promise. I know God wants the one that didn't get healed healed. I know he does, without a doubt. So I'll take the responsibility. A lot of preachers who pray they want to make them the problem like oh you didn't have enough faith I don't see that in the Bible I don't see where you got to have faith to see the gospel I don't see that you don't have to have faith to hear it here let me show it to you 
I've had done that to a lot of people. There was an atheist in here. He used to sit back there and have his hair all out like this, sitting in the back. I'd pray for some people up here, and sometimes a girl would <laughs> scream. You know, I think the devil would do that, try to run some people off. Because I'm not going to go, shh. I ain't going to do that. So one day he told me, he said, man, all that's fake. I said, oh, it's all fake. Okay, well, hey, let me pull these chairs up right here. I'll kick everybody out. Let me pray for you. You don't feel nothing. We'll burn this church down. You ever anybody talk to him like that? Well, he liked it. And he took me up on my challenge. So that next week we came in. I pulled his blue chairs up. I prayed for him. Well, you see the church there. So I'm praying for him. And I don't know why this happened. This will always happen to everybody. He's in the blue chairs. He pushes his elbows up. He lifts his whole body. He was like this in the chair. His hair was like that. He's looking at me. I was looking at him. He's looking at me. And I'm looking at him. He's looking at me. There was no point in saying, did you feel anything? <laughs> Next week he came back, he had his hair cut, kind of like, I want to say like mine, you know, all. He had, a, he had a haircut, his countenance was different, he was different. He ended up going into the army, and becoming the chaplain to the people who were over there dying. Now he takes up for me on Facebook when people try to come against me and call me the devil. <laughs> We got to get fully persuaded, y'all. I don't know what it takes to get fully persuaded, but I knew it took them 40 days, and I know we have to have something like that. I know Jesus can't just rise up on Easter and let's we'll just leave off for the rest of the year and not have 40 days of intense training to say you've got to have faith in God in order to do the things I'm telling you to do. Your faith must be anchored in God in order to go through every trial, every suffering, every test, in order for the lottery winnings not to kill you. Your faith has to be in God. And religion comes along and puts our faith in everything but God. So, Father, we change all that. We put all of our faith in the risen Christ who came to brainwash us that water can be walked on, water can be turned into wine, water can be calmed down, water can be bossed around. And so can the storms and so can food. And there's nothing in this world that can hinder us because the one who made us the promises, he is faithful. We have a God. You know that all he would do in the Old Testament was he would just tell his people, believe me. I took you out of Egypt. Look at me. Look what I've done for you. Look at me. Trust me. Trust me. Like Jesus who said, like a mother hen who wanted to gather her chicks. You wouldn't. All he's ever asked for, the father said, just come to me. Love me. Trust me. Believe in me. That's what Jesus wants from us. If you wake up every day and your faith is so anchored in him and who he is and his faithfulness and all of his promises that he made. Well, see, now you're doing it. Now you can do the work of God. Now you're doing the work of God. And now the works of God will come out of your hands and out of your mouth. We've got to get our relationship back on Jesus. He's the only one that gave us hope in this world and he's the only one that gave us hope for our children. I said, that's what we have to have across the street from the abortion clinics. Another place, a different place, the opposite place where there's life, there's hope, and there's God. Saying, bring me those babies. God said, bring me those babies. 
There's no one that gives you hope for your life but God. It's not his promises. It's him. There's no one that tells you that your kids will come back to you except for God makes you those promises. And that your body can be healed and that your children are not too far gone. They can come back. Father, we're trying to anchor ourselves back into you because you never fail us. And we love you. Lord Jesus, you are worthy of all of our faith and our trust. You are a risen God. And we choose to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.